But uh, for today, we will be in um, a section called Boasting About Tomorrow, James 4, 13 to 17. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, page uh, 1013, if you're using one of the, the Bibles provided there. And it says there, Come now, or now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist or a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. The word of the Lord. Now, um, I've I've prepared my own paraphrase of this passage. I've done this before. I haven't done it recently because some of the passages that we've uh, been studying have been longer. This one's a bit more compact. It's only five verses, and so I've... I've done my own paraphrase of this. This is something that I've found helpful in my own study, just kind of trying to wrap my head around, well, what, what did James say? What was he saying to the original audience? What does it say to us? Um, you know, and as, as I study certain words and phrases and context and all that sort of stuff, it's, I think it's helpful just to kind of put this into my own words. And this is something that I would encourage you to do as well as you study a passage um, as you look into word meanings and, and context and all those different things that I've just mentioned, try to just wrap your head around, okay, what is this really saying? So this is my own paraphrase. And by the way, this is not translation. I'm not a Bible translation expert or scholar. Neither are you, I would assume. So don't worry about like, you know, getting it wrong. Just do the best you can, study it, and then try to wrap your brain around what it's actually saying here. And so here's my own paraphrase of what we just read there. I said... <clears throat> Let's be realistic. Those of you who presumptuously make self-serving plans and cast overly confident predictions should instead recognize that your life and your future is ultimately subject to the sovereign will of God. Think about it. Can you actually predict the future? Of course not. In light of history, in, in light of the history of the world, and with eternity in mind, Your life right now is small and short. So, to presume the future and make plans apart from a humble recognition of God's providence doesn't even make any logical sense. In fact, in this case, I would go so far to say that it's downright arrogant, the way that you pride yourself in your self-sufficiency. And that kind of attitude is simply wrong, evil, in fact. So, for today... Do the good that is right in front of you. Don't allow yourself to fall into the sinful trap of ignoring God's purpose and plan for you today for the sake of some hypothetical tomorrow. The, the issue that I think James was addressing at the time and that, that is addressed in our own lives through this passage is this, um, this, the sin, the issue of presumption, uh, prideful presumption about the future, about about our own self-sufficiency, about our own plan for our lives and, and how we're going to work that out. This, this idea of presumptuous pride or prideful presumption, you can go both ways with those words. And, and we see this in things like uh, this notion of the self-made man. You know, the, the self-made man is kind of a, an American sort of concept where somebody who starts out from, from nothing and kind of works their way up and and um, develops wealth and fame and notoriety, and they've done it themselves. They've gone out, as James says, to, and today or tomorrow, and they've gone out to such and such a place, and they've spent some time, and they've built up their own kind of persona and empire um, and made, it, made a profit and garnered wealth and, and all of these things. This, this self-made man, you know, you think of uh, American characters like Benjamin Franklin. You know, Benjamin Franklin has been described as kind of the original American self-made man. He started out with uh, nothing. He was one of uh, umpteen 
children in his family or whatever, and, and as a young man, he was um, uh, getting room and board, uh, renting room and board from his older brother, and then, you know, started his own business, and eventually became quite a, a notable figure, uh, had lots of wealth, uh, founding father of the of the uh, United States, and, and he's kind of what's been described as the original self-made man. So think of somebody like him, or, or more recently, somebody like Kylie Jenner, who's been touted as the youngest uh, self-made billionaire, in, I think, in the world. Um, and and we, we look at people like that, Benjamin Franklin or a, a Kylie Jenner, and we kind of idealize that, don't we? We kind of place them on a bit of a pedestal. We admire that. We look at their self-sufficiency and how they've, they've built themselves up, and we think, oh, that's, that's admirable. That's good. And we, we, we um, place them in kind of an ideal category in our minds. But the problem with that, of course, is that this idea of self-sufficiency is really an illusion, and this is my big idea here for this message that I want us to, to grab onto this morning, is that the illusion, and I will explain that, the illusion of self-sufficiency must be broken, how? By embracing God's will with humility and acting on gospel-oriented knowledge and responsibility. Or more simply put, you are little, God is big, So just do the right thing and do it today, okay? So first of all, I want to talk about this illusion of self-sufficiency. This is verses 13 and 14. We have in there in verse 13 kind of the picture, the the image of self-sufficiency. You know, think of the Benjamin Franklins or the the Kylie Jenners. It says, these are those who say, today or tomorrow... We will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. That's the picture of self-sufficiency. But then, verse 14, he says, Yet, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. So this picture of self-sufficiency, this self-made person, is really just an illusion. It reminds me of other scriptures like Proverbs 27.1 that says, Do not boast about tomorrow. For you do not know what a day may bring. Reminds me too of a a parable in Luke 12. You could turn there if you like. Luke 12. uh, Jesus often uh, spoke in parables, these stories with a point, um, a way of illustrating what he was trying to teach. And there in Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 16, This is the parable of the rich fool, and it says there, um, and he, Jesus, told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul? I don't know why. That just seems so funny. I just I imagine the guy looking in the mirror, you know, just like patting himself on the back, you know, just giving himself a two thumbs up. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, Eesh. fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? I mean, think about that. Think about what's common between a Benjamin Franklin and a Kylie Jenner and all of us. What what is the common condition that we all share? We we will all die. Benjamin Franklin's already already done that. Um, You can check that one off the list. But the things that he has prepared, the treasure that he had laid up, the treasure that we all lay up, the the things that we prepare, in the end, whose will they be? It's a sobering thought. This also, uh, this point of of this illusion of self-sufficiency and being um, 
sure in myself, you know, and, and, and my life and my plans and all this kind of stuff. This reminds me, too, of really the, the message and the tone of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've read Ecclesiastes uh, lately. It's, it's uh, when you kind of first read it, it's a strange book. It's hard to understand. Um, it's a difficult one. It's a challenging one, but uh, I studied it earlier this year as part of a course I was taking, and um, our understanding of Ecclesiastes really hinges on the meaning and, and how we translate and understand one word in there. And uh, the word is, is found right away in the very beginning of the book when it says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, or meaningless is another way of putting it. Meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. That word vanity or meaningless in the original Hebrew that that would have been written in is the word hevel. It's spelled H-E-B-E-L. That's the English transliteration of it. But it's pronounced hevel, hevel. This word has a few different meanings. The first meaning is it could refer to an idol, a fashioned object with a focus, okay, with a focus on its lack of value, okay, vanity, meaningless. It can also really mean meaninglessness, emptiness, futility, uselessness. Uh, That is, what is of no use on the basis of being futile and lacking in content. But a third meaning for this word that we find in Ecclesiastes is it can refer to a breath or a vapor, a unit of air that passes in and out of the lungs through the mouth and nostrils with a focus on its briefness and lack of content. This is what James says, what is your life? You are, you are a mist, a vapor, a puff. It's, it's there for a moment and it's gone. Can you, can you grab onto it? Can you even really see it? It's, it's just fleeting. It's barely there. This is our life. This is the idea of, of the self-sufficiency is really just it's, it's, an, it's an illusion, it's a puff, it's there and it's gone. It reminds me of, um, you know, this, this idea of self-sufficiency in the self-made person. It reminds me of, um, uh, learn, you know, teaching a young child how to ride a bike. If you've ever done that, um, you can maybe relate to this. And pro tip, by the way, it took me a while to learn this, but um, for, for you that are maybe teaching kids how to ride bikes, Take the pedals off. Get rid of the pedals or get one of those bikes that's just a coaster. If, if the kid doesn't have to worry about the pedals and they can just learn how to balance and like just roll down a little hill, it, it'll go way better for you. So anyways, that's my, uh, that's my tip of the day. But, you know, when a child is learning how to ride a bike, they're sitting on the bike, okay? Their feet are on the pedals, if they're still on there. They're hanging on to the handlebars, but are they even really riding the bike? They're, they are riding the bike, but are they, are they doing it? Because usually when you're teaching the kid, what, like, you know, you know the classic posture, right? The, the hand on the back of the seat and the one hand on, on the handlebar. And it's, it's actually the, the grown-up. It's the person. It's the parent, the, the adult who's, who's producing the forward movement and is creating the stability and is steering the bike along. And that's kind of a picture of our lives. You know, we're, yeah, we're, we're living our lives, we're sitting there, we're, we're hanging on, and we think, I'm doing this. And that's what the child thinks. I'm doing this. I did it all by myself. Yeah, really? Did you? No, you didn't. That's kind of, again, that's kind of our lives. It's like, I, I'm doing this. Nah. No, who, who's got his hands on you and is moving you through life and keeping you upright and, and steering you along? That, that sense of self-sufficiency is, is an illusion. God, God is, is there doing that. Now, thinking about applying this to our lives, a couple of questions come to mind when, you, when, you read, when we read these, these verses, verses 13 and, and, uh, and 14, thinking about this illusion of self-sufficiency and all that. Two questions. First of all, very practical questions. Is it wrong to have a profitable business, right? Because when you read this, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such and such a town, spend a year and trade and make a profit. So is it wrong to have a profitable business? Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's what this is saying. I think that if, uh, if you're honoring God with the resources that he's given you and uh, you are working hard and you're stewarding what God has blessed you with and he's blessing you in your business 
and it's growing and you're generating a profit, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Is money evil? No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the love of money is what's the root of all evil. So, so simply to answer that question, is it wrong to have a profitable business? No. Is planning for the future evil? Is it wrong to, to plan for retirement, to, to save up and to, to plan for the future? Well, no, I don't think that's wrong either. I don't think planning for the future is evil. You know, think of, um, of scriptures like in Proverbs 6, where it's addressing the sluggard, the sort of the typical lazy person. And it says there, um, consider the ant, you know, who stores up for the winter, who saves up and, and is prepared. And you should do that, is basically what it says. And so, is planning for the future, is saving up evil? No. No, it's not. What matters is the position and posture and attitude of our hearts, okay? Those things in themselves are profitable business, saving, those are not wrong, those are not bad things. But is our sense of sufficiency in those things? Well, then that's, that's where we go wrong. But if our sense of sufficiency is in God, then we're doing well, then we're, then we're getting it right. And so, this notion of self-sufficiency is really uh, an illusion. So, what's the alternative? Uh, the alternative there is in verse 15 and 16, uh, where we learn how to embrace God's will with humility. Embracing God's will with humility. It says in verse 15, instead, so this is the alternative to, to uh, self uh, pridefully presuming the future and my plans. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. This is, um, this, if the Lord wills, this is what's known in Latin, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher the Latin pronunciation here, but it's, it's the conditio Jacobea. Jacob is a variant of the word James, so James and, and Jacob, same, same thing, and so in Latin, it translates out as as the conditio Jacobea. This is the, if the Lord wills it. This is the condition that James says we should employ to qualify all of our plans. Now, even that, though, can, can go wrong. Even that can be turned um, in a bad direction. Even this idea of saying, if the Lord wills, can turn into unhelpful presumption. You know, when you think about um, the Crusaders, right? The Crusaders in the uh, what would that be, the 11th century, 12th century, somewhere around there. Uh, the Crusaders were European knights and uh, soldiers and others who, who went to the Holy Land to take back Jerusalem from the Muslims. And their motto became, God wills it. Again, in Latin, I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, but it's Deus Volt. That was their motto, God wills it. Not if the Lord wills it, but God wills it. I want to do it, therefore God wills it, was kind of the, the, what that attitude turned into. So we can, we can even take something like this, embracing God's will, and we can even turn that into unhelpful presumption. So the key really here, the key is this idea of humility. Verse 16, where he says, um, as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So, the key is humility. The opposite is this arrogant boasting that he talks about. So, so, we can't get into that. So, humility, that needs to be the posture and attitude and position of our hearts in this. The emphasis here is on humility. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need something in my life to remind me of this and to remind me of of the smallness and shortness of my life and to bring me back down to earth, as it were, and to, to um, remind me of this, this key of humility. Um, recently, I was out for a walk, and I've been trying to do a lot more walking uh, this year, and I've done some long walks. And the other day, I was out for a walk, and I ended up in the new cemetery here in Salmon Arm, just up the hill there, uh, kind of the corner of Otto and 20th. And... Uh, I walked through there, and I was able to go to the grave sites of a couple of dear saints that I had the privilege of, of being with 
their families as we placed them in the ground there and, and saw those graves. And, um, but, you know, I don't know if you've walked through a cemetery recently. It, maybe it sounds weird and kind of morbid to do that, but um, especially if you don't have a loved one in there, it's maybe a bit of an odd thing to do. But, um, but I, I did that, and I walked through there, and I, um, I was struck by just the, the humbling um, nature of that of doing that exercise, of walking through and looking at the, the graves and seeing the names of all these people who, some young, some old, and in, in any case, they, they had their lives. You know, they lived their lives, and, and then their lives came to an end. And it was a reminder of, of that'll be me one day. I'm, I'm going to be in a place like this, and I'm going to be laid to rest. My life will, will come to an end. And that's, that's a humbling experience to consider your life, to reflect on your life in that sense. And sometimes doing something tangible and visible like that uh, helps enable that experience. So thinking about our lives, you know, when James says there, um, as it is you boast, or sorry, where am I going here? What is your, going back to verse 14, in fact, what is your life? You are mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. A little time and then vanishes. What does he mean by a little time? Well, think of it this way. The average life expectancy in Canada right now is about 82 years old. It varies between uh, men and women, um, but it's on average 82 years, okay? It's a little longer in some places in the world. I think Australia is a bit longer. Uh, In the U.S., it's a little bit shorter. Um, But 82 years, uh, is kind of what we can, on average, expect. Now, it sounds like a long time, you know, especially if you're, if you're quite young. 82 years seems like an eternity. Um, I'm more than halfway there now, and so it doesn't feel quite like an eternity anymore, uh, but 82 years. Now, to put that into perspective, um, some people believe that the earth is billions and billions of years old, okay? So that, that's a really long time, and I'm not getting into creationism, please don't send me videos about creation versus ev- evolution, and just don't, I don't want to get into, that's not, what, that's not my point, but, but on the long end, billions and billions, so that's not a great comparison, so let's go short, right, so if you're a young earth creationist and you believe that the earth is somewhere between six and 10,000 years old, okay, let's go with that, let's, let's make it, let's go with the shortest time, 6,000, okay, 6,000, so if, if at the shortest, the earth is 6,000 years old, your 82 years of that 6,000 represents 0.013% of that time. Your life is, takes up 0.0137% of that total time. That's not a lot. That's real short. That's a little time. And then what does he mean for... Or what does it mean for my life to vanish? He says, you, you're, you're here for a little time, and then, and then your life will vanish. What does it mean for your life to vanish? Well, he's, not, he, he's, he's referring to really the, the physical life, your physical life on earth at this time. Of course, we believe in eternity. We believe in, in life after death. Okay, we believe that you go somewhere when you die. He's referring to your physical life on earth at this time. So again, another comparison. Statisticians have estimated that 117 billion people have ever lived on the earth in the course of human history. I don't know how they get that number. Again, I don't want to get into that. How old the earth is and people and evolution. I'm not not talking about that. Please don't send me your YouTube videos. But if we go with that number, 117 billion people who've ever lived, how many of those do we know about and have left some kind of legacy? You know, we think of, okay, Benjamin Franklin, going back to him. Kylie Jenner, okay, we know something about those people. But how many of those 117 billion people actually make it into the history books? Maybe a few thousand? Like, it's, it's not a lot. Your life is short, and it will vanish. I will, I will die and be forgotten. That's the reality. That's, that's what will happen. And so, with that in mind, thinking about, again, applying this 
embracing of God's will with humility. Another question is, is it as simple as saying the words, if the Lord wills? Is it as simple as just tacking that on? You know, well, the Lord willing. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Of course, it can be, because just in a, in a formulaic way, just adding these words, well, that just sort of devolves into a mere incantation, that if we just say these right words. So again, it has to be about the heart. It has to be about the posture and attitude of our of our heart, and that, that humble attitude of accepting and embracing what God is doing in your life and how he's directing you, how he's keeping you upright and steering you and moving you forward on the bike of life, as it were. So self-sufficiency is an illusion, so therefore we must embrace God's will with humility. And then, thirdly, it's our job to act on, on knowledge and responsibility. We need to be doers, as James says, not, not just hearers, not judges, as we looked at previously in the previous message, but doers of what God is telling us to do, doers of God's will, people who act on knowledge and responsibility. This is verse 17, where it says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, this verse, when you first read this uh, this little section here. This verse seems to be out of place a little bit. I don't know, maybe that's just me, but I, I read it and I'm like, where did that come from? It seems to be somewhat disconnected, but, but we have to look at the, the first word in that sentence. The word is so, or therefore, which implies that it is indeed connected to the previous verses. And so, what this means basically is that in light of the perspective that we just talked about, uh, the illusion of self-sufficiency, the, the embracing of God's will with humility. In light of that perspective, the instruction now is to go and do the right thing. He's saying that now armed with knowledge, you know, knowledge, just knowledge alone is not enough. Now we've got to do something with it. Take responsibility. Put what you know into action. And do not delay because you may not have a tomorrow. This, this verse is where we get the teaching on um, sins of omission from, right? There's, there's sins of commission where we, where we commit a sin, where we do something that we shouldn't do. We do something wrong. We, 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 um, we act wrongly. This is teaching about sins of omission where we omit doing the right thing, where we fail to do the, the right thing, what we know we ought to do um, without delay, a um, couple of famous last words that I have heard people use over and over again, and I have used myself, and just as guilty of this, uh, two words, uh, one day. One day. One day I will help that person. One day I will mend that broken relationship. One day I will start giving away some of my income uh, with a generous and joyful spirit, one day I will start reading my Bible and getting a, a prayer life together. One day I'm going to do these things. But of course, we all know that the problem with one day is that that day never comes. It almost never happens. We almost never get to those things that we say one day. And so, apply this to your own life. And let me ask you, what, what good is right in front of you right now that you need to do, that you can do, that you should do, that you shouldn't delay anymore? What, what is it that you need to do? What have you been putting off because you're too busy thinking about five years from now? And trust me, I am guilty of this. This is, this is for me right now, this bit, because I am, in my head, it's 2028 right now. And I'm thinking about some detail that I could never even possibly wrap my head around. I'm thinking about tomorrow I'm going to go and do this and I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to trade and make a profit or whatever, whatever the case. That's, that's how I think. And I'm like, oh man, I got to go walk through a cemetery, <laughs> get my head on straight here. So think about your own situation. What is it? What is it? Now, coming to the table of the Lord's Supper 
is an incredible opportunity to reflect on this and to, um, to do something with this. It's an incredible opportunity to consider, really, the illusion of self-sufficiency because the gospel tells us that God's grace is what's sufficient. You know, when we come to the table, I often say this, but we come to the table with nothing, and he comes with everything. He provides the whole meal for us. Our sufficiency is not in ourselves, but it's in him. It's also an opportunity to consider God's will with humility because according to his will, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me and for you and for us corporately. If that's not uh, humbling, you know, the thought of his life for mine, if that's not humbling, then I don't know what is. Also, it's an opportunity to reflect on our lives and the action that we ought to take in light of the knowledge that we have. So, for example, is there a broken relationship that you need to reconcile before you come to this table? Maybe you need to hold off for today until you can do what you can to, to get things right in that sense. That's between you and, and that person and between you and the Lord. But as we come to the table then, we are instructed to examine ourselves in that sense. And so I think this is an opportunity to do that. Um, if you are here today and you're a Christian and you plan on participating in this meal um, and you haven't received these elements, uh, just indicate so and and some of our ushers will be around to, to serve you. And we're going to open up the components. Let's take a moment, as Paul said, to examine yourself then, and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Think about your life. Think about your relationships right now. Think about the things that are perhaps out of line with God's will. Think about the ways that, we've, that you've fallen into this, this trap of prideful presumption. This is an opportunity now to come back to recenter on, on the sovereignty of God, the, the providence of God, and how he's, he's, he's the one working out your life. And Take this moment to confess your sin, to repent, and then we will um, partake together.